Good morning. As has been said, we're thankful for everyone's presence. And if you're here and count yourself as a visitor, we're especially thankful to have you with us this morning. And uh, this morning, we're going to continue our series from the book of Genesis that we've been studying uh, on Sunday evenings for several weeks now. If you haven't been able to join us for that study, we're following the outline of a children's uh, Bible storybook called The Biggest Story. Not that we're teaching from that book, obviously, but uh, we recommended it to parents of, of young children, and, and Nate has been sharing some of the uh, videos and activities that go along with that book uh, in his weekly email in the hopes that families will be able to study the Bible uh, story ahead of time and hopefully gain more from the lessons as we study them together. And so in last week's study of, of Genesis 11 through 13, we were introduced to Abram, the father of nations. <clears throat> and today we'll continue with the story of Abram, or Abraham, as he will come to be known, with a lesson that's called, Let's Make a Deal, which is based on Genesis 15 and 17. <clears throat> Let me begin with just a, a quick recap of, of our last study. You'll remember that Abram was called by God <clears throat> to leave his home, his home country of Ur, and to travel to a land that was yet unknown to him. God promised that he would Make of Abram a great nation. <clears throat> Not only would God bless him, but in Abram, all the families of the earth would also be blessed. And so Abram traveled along with his father, uh, Terah, and his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot. <clears throat> they stopped and settled for a while in Haran, where uh, his father died. And then they continued on to the land of Canaan. And when we last left Abram in chapter 13, <clears throat> he and Lot had separated simply because the land could not support them both. <clears throat> Lot had chosen the fertile valley towards Sodom, and Abram stayed there in Canaan. And God spoke to Abram once again and renewed his promise of land as well as offspring. God said offspring as numerous as the dust of the earth. Well, as I said, our study today picks up with chapter 15. But I think it's worth at least mentioning the events that happen in chapter 14. Uh, Lot, having settled in Sodom, gets caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. A great battle arises um, amongst uh, at least nine different kings or kingdoms. And uh, included are the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah who are defeated. And so swept up in all this was, was Lot. And he and his possessions are captured and carried away. And when Abram learns that his nephew had been taken captive, he leads a, a group of 318 trained men on a rescue mission. And they split up by night and they defeat the kidnappers and they bring Lot back along with the women and the people and all the possessions. Well, on his way back from this mission, Abraham, or Abram rather, encounters Melchizedek, the king of Salem and also a priest of God. And you may remember that uh, we studied this unusual prophet king in our studies of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews brings out the fact that Jesus was a priest of the order of Melchizedek. And there's lots that uh, we studied that, that's uh, connected there between Jesus and, and Melchizedek. For example, Melchizedek was both a priest and a king, as Jesus, of course, uh, is as well. But Abram's also approached by the king of Sodom, who offers him the, the spoils of war uh, as thanks for his efforts. Abraham refuses, and he says that I made an oath to God that I would not keep anything that belonged to Sodom, lest you would say that you had made me rich. And so let's notice now what's brought out in the story beginning in Genesis chapter 15. Once again, we find God coming to Abram, this time in a vision, in order to confirm and perhaps expound on his promises. In Genesis 15, verse 1, he says, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Just those first two words, fear not, are perhaps some of the most comforting words found in Scripture, especially when we consider their source. Psalm 27, and verse 1, puts it beautifully. There we read, The Lord is my light, and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? In fact, those who spend their time counting such things tell us that 
fear not or do not be afraid is actually the most repeated command in the Bible. But we might ask here, well, what was it that Abram was afraid of in particular? And I guess there's lots of things we could guess that, that he may have been afraid of. Uh, following the invasion and the capture and the rescue of Lot that uh, was just described in chapter 14, maybe Abram was afraid uh, for his family and for his safety. Uh, these kings might return and, and retaliate against him. Or maybe he was afraid that he'd done the wrong thing there at the end of chapter 14 when he refused the gift that the king of Sodom had offered him. After all, when would you ever get a chance like that to enjoy such spoils of victory being offered to you from a king? Or maybe even though he had been in Canaan for a while now that he was still afraid of this strange land and its inhabitants, the Canaanites. Abram had left his comfort zone back in Ur and in many ways he was alone. The only family he had was Sarai and, and Lot. And as we've already seen, Lot uh, was more trouble than, than not sometimes. But I tend to agree with, with what the commentator Kaufman uh, said in his uh, writings on this verse. He said, It appears that the principal thing on Abram's mind was that the years were slipping away and that as yet he had no child. At least that was the thing that Abram brought up at once. And we're going to see that in, in Abram's response. God also adds, I am your shield, a promise of protection over Abraham or Abram. And then once again, God reiterates that Abram would be greatly rewarded. Well, as I said, this time Abram has a response to God's promise. In verses two and three, he says, O Lord God, what will you give me? Again, God had just said you will be greatly rewarded. What will you give me? For I continue childless. Some versions have, I will die childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Eliezer was Abraham's steward. Uh, he was a very loyal servant. We learn more about him in Genesis, the 24th chapter. There, Abram sends this servant to find a wife for his son Isaac. But at this point, there was no son. And so this foreign servant was the closest thing that Abram had to a son. And in the least, Abram, if he were to die, he's afraid that all that he had would go to Eliezer. Now I'm sure when we read Abram's response here to God, it might raise our eyebrows, if you will. Who does he think he is challenging God? But before we accuse Abram of being belligerent, I think we need to understand where he's coming from. Remember, first of all, Abram's background. As we noticed last time, he was raised by a father who apparently worshipped false gods. And then he was called by this god to leave his homeland, travel to an unknown destination. He'd been following God now for many years, yet didn't seem any closer to the promise of becoming even a father, much less a nation. I think it's safe to say that, that Abram was discouraged. Maybe disappointed. And who of us can honestly say that we haven't been in his shoes? Hoping and praying and expecting an answer from God that seems to continually be delayed. The psalmist David must have felt a similar longing and, and restlessness. <clears throat> in Psalm 13 he wrote, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? In the book of Revelation, we even get a glimpse that uh, the awaiting souls in heaven have such a feeling of, of anticipation, if you will. In Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, we read, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. And so I think it's safe to say that 
that God understood Abram's concerns. And instead of chastising him, God reassures him. He says in verse 4, This man, Eliezer, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. I like how the New King James Version puts it. One who will come from your own body shall be your heir. God promises, or God's promise will be fulfilled, not in a roundabout way as, as Abram by now apparently was uh, considering, not through a servant, not by his nephew Lot, not even by an adopted son, even though by now Abram was probably in his late 70s at least. It would be fulfilled through a son of his own flesh and blood. And then God emphasizes this promise with another vivid illustration. Previously, as we said, he had told uh, that Abram's offspring would be as numerous as the dust of the earth, Genesis 13 and 16. But now God takes Abram outside, if not literally, then at least uh, through the vision. And he says in verse 5, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. I can imagine a, a clear night, no clouds, no fog, no city lights to distract from the wondrous light show that, that God himself had placed there in the night sky. And if you've ever stood and, and stared at the stars on such a night, you know it can be awe-inspiring just to imagine how far away they are, yet how bright. And most of all, how many. In fact, even with our modern technology, the stars are, are still impossible to accurately count. And so God says, count these stars if you can even do so. And he says, so shall your offspring be. God is simply saying to Abram, I will keep my promise to you in ways beyond your imagination. And little did Abram realize that God's promise not only would be fulfilled in a physical nation, um, to Abram or Abraham would be born a son, Isaac, and to Isaac, a son, Jacob, and to Jacob, 12 sons from which a whole nation, the nation of Israel, would come. But I have to believe that God also had in mind here something far beyond that. Because eventually from Abram's lineage would come Jesus, the Messiah, who would rule as a king over a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom that you and I are so blessed to have the opportunity to be members of today. In essence, you and I are numbered among those stars that Abram viewed on that night so many years ago. Verse 6 makes an amazing statement. It says, And he, that is Abram, believed the Lord, and he, that is God, counted it to him as righteousness. Paul would make mention of this event in his letter to the Romans in Romans 4 and verse 3. The righteousness, uh, the word righteousness here means right standing with God. And so simply put, God was pleased with Abram's faith. As we know, he's listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, as, as we've uh, noted before. But regardless of the trials that Abram had been through and the doubts that may have arisen in his mind because of God's seeming delay in fulfilling his promises, he still believed God. And God did not take that lightly. And I don't believe he takes it lightly today either. God is pleased when we have faith in him. I feel obligated here, though, to mention that belief or faith is more than just a, a mental consent. It's more than just saying, yes, I believe. True faith includes obedience. And Abram had already proven that, and he would continue to do so. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't still have slip-ups, as we've seen before and as we'll still see. But the reason I bring this up is because, sadly, this verse here, Genesis 15 and 6, has often been claimed as an anchor for the faith-only doctrine. In fact, some, such as Martin Luther, uh, have gone so far as to say that until this moment, Abram was a lost sinner, but at this point he became righteous, or he was justified. Never mind the fact that Abram had been obeying God long before this moment. In Romans, the fourth chapter, um, as we mentioned, Paul is speaking about the works of the law, and he makes the point that Abram was counted as righteous because of his belief, which included obedience, long before the law was established. And we know that there are 
plenty of other passages that show the necessity of obeying God's commands, commands in order to be saved. So this verse in no way contradicts that. Yes, Abram believed and he obeyed. Well, moving along in verses 7 and 8, God reminds Abram of the land promise that he'd previously made back in Ur. And Abram asks him for some sort of confirmation. And what follows is, I admit, a, a rather strange scene. Now keep in mind, all of this might still be occurring in the form of a vision. But God tells Abram to bring animals, a heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon. And these animals, except for the birds, they were to be cut in half and laid out. And then let's jump to verse 17 there. Abram sees a, a flaming torch and a smoking fire pot or oven passing between the divided animal halves. As I said, a strange scene. And there are different interpretations of this part of the vision that, that people have made, but I think the most likely meaning is that these items, these two items, the torch and the fire pot, they symbolize God. God passing between the animal pieces, uh, if you will. Because that uh, was a ritual, a very well-known ritual at that time that identified or, or ratified, rather, a covenant. In other words, at that time, um, this, these animals would be split and those who were going into an agreement or a deal, as our title puts it, um, would walk or pass between these dead animals. And in so doing, they were basically saying or announcing if I don't live up to my end of this agreement, then may the same thing happen to me that's happened to these animals. And there seems to be a reference to this ritual uh, in Jeremiah, the 34th chapter, verses 18 and 19. God says there, And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. If that is the, the meaning behind Abram's vision here, then it's interesting that, that Abram apparently did not participate in this ritual. Only God passes between the animals. God was making a promise to him, not necessarily the other way around, but showing how serious he was about his promise. And God would remain true to his word. In fact, eventually all these lands that are mentioned here in verses 18 through 20 were in fact given to the Israelites, to uh, Abraham's offspring. Well, speaking of Israel, let, let's go back and notice uh, verses 12 through 16. Because what we find here is an amazing prophecy, although I'm not really sure that's the right word for it. I don't know if God prophesies. Uh, the future is in his hands, right? He determines the future. But at any rate, God lays out hundreds of years ahead what will happen to Abram's lineage. It's, it's uncanny, really. And it's not all good news, not something necessarily that's going to encourage Abram, to be honest. Uh, that might explain the dreadful darkness that's mentioned here in this part of the vision. But it is the truth. God tells Abram that his offspring will be sojourners and servants in a foreign land. And I think that's obviously a reference to Israel being enslaved in Egypt. That they will be afflicted for 400 years, which is exactly what came to pass. Uh, we can find that in Exodus 12 and verse 40. God said that He would bring judgment on the nation that they served, uh, a reference to the plagues, the ten plagues that were carried out on Egypt. And then His offspring would come out with great possessions. Again, that's exactly what happened. As the children of Israel left Egypt, according to Exodus 12 and verse 36, they plundered the Egyptians. Verse 15 takes kind of a, a sidestep here uh, as Abram is reassured that, that he will not actually witness any of these things since he would die in peace at a good old age. I like the way God puts that. And then in verse 16, God says that they, meaning Abram's offspring, Israel, would come back here, meaning come back to Canaan, to finally claim it. And notice that he adds, 
for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I like how one commentator explained this. He said, God would not arbitrarily dispossess one people for another. God doesn't just kick one uh, group out and bring someone else in, even to fulfill his purpose. Later, when the Canaanites were conquered, it was because they had lost the right to that land by their own sinfulness. In fact, we saw proof of that last week. Uh, we noticed Deuteronomy 9 and verse 5, where the Israelites were reminded just before they were about to conquer Canaan, they were reminded, not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. As I said, it's amazing how God foretells the, the history of, of Israel here. Whether Abram understood all that or not, we don't know. But, but we can look now and see that it all came to pass. And that brings us to the end of, of chapter 15 of Genesis. What follows in chapter 16 is a, a rather disheartening scene. Uh, it's not directly covered in, in the biggest story book, but, but it's the account of Hagar, the Egyptian servant of Sarai. About 10 years seem to have passed between uh, chapter 15 with this remarkable confirmation of God's covenant with Abram, as we just noticed, this vision, and chapter 16. Abram and Sarai had still not had a baby. And by now, Abram was 85 or 86 years old. And it seems that Sarai ran out of patience. She urged Abram to take her servant Hagar as a wife so that she instead could bear him a child. Sarah assumed that God had closed her womb, ignoring the possibility that God was simply waiting on his own timing. And Abram, in a moment of weakness, I suppose, agreed, and a son was born, and they named him Ishmael. And what follows is a sad set of circumstances that, to be honest, the world is still dealing with today. Modern Islamic and Muslim cultures trace their lineage back to Hagar and to Ishmael. And as we know, there is no love lost between them and the people of Israel, even to this day. Well, that brings us to Genesis, the 17th chapter. Abram is now 99 years old. And once again, God appears to him with the covenant, not a new covenant, but a, a clearer and a more detailed explanation of it. As well, God also began to make clear what would be expected of Abram and his offspring in keeping this covenant. In essence, as our title suggests, God says, let's make a deal. Beginning in verse 1 there, he says, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be, and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, <clears throat> my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. As we said, this is not a completely new covenant. God had previously <clears throat> promised Abram that he would be the father of nations and that his offspring would possess the land of Canaan. But there are definitely some, some new nuances, if you will. Uh, this time. First of all, God begins with a call for Abram's reverence and his obedience. Whether this was in answer to what had happened in chapter 16, I'm not sure, but, but God certainly had the right to demand something in return for his uh, gracious blessings. And Abram, Abram responds appropriately, humbling himself before God. And next, God announces what must have been a surprise to a 99 year old man. He changes Abram's name to Abraham. I kind of have to laugh when I think about that. The poor guy's been using the same name for 99 years, and now he's got to try to remember a new one. I, I have a hard enough time remembering uh, names at my age. Scholars are, are divided on the meaning of this name change. 
Uh, some say that Abram meant exalted father, which, by the way, had to kind of feel like a, a bitter irony every time Abram heard his name, since he was not yet a father. But the name Abraham supposedly meant father of a multitude, obviously bringing attention to, to God's promise. There's also the possibility that the name Abram was a foreign name, maybe even perhaps associated with the, the pagan Chaldeans where Abram was born. And so God renamed Abraham to disassociate him from his past and to reestablish him in his faith in God alone. Notice that God further expands this promise by saying that nations and even kings would come from Abraham and that this would be an everlasting covenant. And I think this has direct reference to Jesus. After all, the real purpose of this covenant was the delivery of the Messiah. There would be other kings along the way, but Jesus would be the king of kings, and his kingdom would indeed, would indeed be eternal. I should note here that, that modern-day um, Israelites use this promise to, to claim that they have the right, the divine right, to the whole land of Canaan, and particularly Palestine. There are even some Christians who, who uh, uphold that. This land promise that God made was contingent on their obedience. Again, that was commanded in verse 1. And I believe that Israel forfeited those blessings by their failure to obey. But Christ's kingdom, His everlasting and spiritual kingdom, is available to everyone, including Jews and including Palestinians. God was not done with his elaboration of this covenant. Years earlier, God had given Abram a sign that, that he would live up to his promises, as we noticed in that vision with the flaming torch and the smoking fire pot. But now he gives Abraham and his offspring a sign to show that they believe God and that they would hold up to their end of the bargain. In verses 9 through 14, we read, And God said to Abraham, As for you... You shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout your generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offering, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now I'll leave it to the parents to explain the uh, details of what circumcision is, but suffice it to say this was a, a physical, a very personal um, symbol of submission to God and belief in His promises and submission to this covenant. It was established between God and Abraham and it was extended actually to the law of Moses according to Leviticus 12 and verse 3. But that commandment ended with the establishment of the new covenant. And it is not required of Christians today. That can be seen uh, several times in passages such as Acts 15, uh, Galatians 5 and verse 6. To borrow an analogy from the Apostle Paul, Christ is interested in circumcision of the heart, Romans 2.29. And I might add that it's sometimes debated whether baptism in the New Testament is the equivalent of circumcision in the Old Testament. Admittedly, there are some similarities, but, but there are also many differences. And several false doctrines, such as infant baptism, uh, the belief that baptism is just an outward sign those beliefs have either emerged or have been supported by this theory that baptism is equal to circumcision. And so we should be careful not to, to make parallels where the Bible necessarily does not. But back to our text here in, in Genesis 17. God was still not finished confirming and further explaining the covenant that he was making with Abraham. Beginning with verse 15, God explains Sarai's part in this covenant. He says, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her, not from Hagar. Just as Abram 
got a new name. Uh, his wife, Sarah, too, was given a new name, Sarah. And again, there are differences of opinion on the meaning of this name change. Some have suggested that Sarah meant my princess, as in Abram's personal princess, whereas Sarah was a more general royal title, princess, as in princess of, of many, um, just as Abraham would be a father of, of many. Others say that the name change, again, uh, had more to do with replacing her pagan past. But, but either way, God makes it very clear that he would give Abraham a son by Sarah. In case there had been any room for doubt based on their previous actions in chapter 16, Sarah would become the mother of many nations. In verses 17 through 21, we get Abraham's initial reaction to God's revelation. It says, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Once again, translation difficulties cause debate about what kind of laugh Abraham responded with here. Was it a, a laugh of joy and surprise? I'm sure he was thrilled to hear that Sarah, who is now 90 years old, would finally get to be a mother. Or was it a laugh of, of doubt and unbelief? In which case he suggests that, that maybe Ishmael would be a more reasonable solution. Well, if so, God doesn't reprimand Abraham for his laugh here as he does Sarah's laughter later in chapter 18. But God does make it very clear that Sarah would, in fact, have a son and that they would name him Isaac. And through him, God would establish his everlasting covenant, which, as we've said, refers to Jesus. Well, finally, God puts a, a timeline on the fulfillment of his promise within the next year. After decades of, of waiting, Abraham and Sarah finally know when this will all take place. We might wonder why God made them wait so long. That's not for us to say. But I like how one commentator put it. He said, God fulfills His promises not because they are reasonable by human standards, but because God is God and His Word is true and absolutely reliable. Well, what was Abraham's reaction to all this? You know, he'd just been hit with a lot to take in. Name changes for him and his wife. At 99 years old, the revelation that he was still going to have a son with his 90-year-old wife, a son who would make him a father of nations, of kings no less, plus this new command for him and all the male members of his household to be circumcised. How did Abraham respond to all this? Did he say, God, I'm going to need some time to think about this. Or let me sit down with my lawyers and take a look at this deal that you've laid out and I'll have my people call your people. No, not at all. Verses 22 through 27, we find that after God was finished talking, he went up from Abraham. And Abraham took his son Ishmael and all the males of his household, including himself, and notice that very day he did just as God had said to him. I think Abraham's reaction can be summed up in, in two words. Trust and obey. And in fact, that's been the overall theme of the story of Abraham all along. Perhaps the theme of the whole Bible. As the narrator of the biggest story book puts it, God kept telling this old couple the same thing over and over. The one thing they needed to hear, and the one thing we have a hard time hearing, just trust me. It's one thing to say that we trust God, but as we've pointed out many times, true faith and trust in God are proven by our obedience. 